Welcome to the art and science of difficult conversations. I'm Chris. And I'm Lucy, and we love having difficult conversations. That's right. And each week, we'll either share a tip, hear how others have gotten better at difficult conversations, or demonstrate common difficult conversations and what to do and what not to do. Let's get into it. Today, we have a real special treat for you. This is somebody I grew up with. This is somebody that I spent a lot of formative years with. Uh, and after high school, we kind of went our separate ways and she became a, just a big time financial tech executive. She's doing her own thing, blazing her own path. But what I think is interesting is we both grew up in an Asian church. We both grew up children of Asian immigrants. And so that comes with a whole host of things. And so Tiffany, Thank you so much for joining me on this podcast. Chris, it's a pleasure to be here. It's great to reconnect after almost two decades, and I'm really excited to have this conversation. Yeah, and, and you know, I've I've followed you for, for a while because we're still friends on Facebook and LinkedIn, so I, I know you've been doing amazing things. But do you want to give just like a general, a quick, you know, Cliff Notes version of kind of where you've been and where your journey's taken you over the past 20 years? Sure. So it's so funny because that was almost, yeah, almost 18 years ago. Uh, after New York, I moved out west to California, went to Stanford undergrad. I was actually a neuroscience and psych major because I had this question of how can, how do people make decisions? How do people think? How do people become who they are? And I ended up going into business of all things, mm. which is largely the discipline of how people make buying decisions. So that's kind of the connection. People sometimes ask me, how did you start in psychology and end up in business? Along the way, I realized that I didn't have the skills and tools I needed to have hard conversations growing up in the family of origin and cultural origin that we did. I think we grew up in these contexts where you weren't supposed to have big emotions, you weren't supposed to have the bad emotions. And what it meant was I ended up in the business world without some really key skills of how to express anger in a productive way, how to give mm. feedback in a way mm. that wasn't damaging, and how to resolve conflict. So in the 20 years since we've spoken, I've been on this journey of how to build up my own toolkit of how to mm. have better conversations. And I usually apply this in the business context, but I've also used this a lot in my personal life. I'll also note here that um, after college, I co-founded a startup, had an amazing experience, growing that from five people to 250 people. I was 26 and I had 45 rep reports. And so I had wow. exposure to workplace conflict really early because I was in management really early. And I ended up taking a conflict mediation certification. That's, you know, I'm wondering, what did your parents and your family teach you about, you know, you said you weren't taught much about giving feedback or having those hard conversations. Was it ever explicitly told to you how to behave in conversations? Mm, that's such a great question. I think there's what's said and then there's what's modeled. Like what is the mm. lived experience? Mm -hmm. And yeah. then what is, what are some of the really specific experiences that you've had growing up? I remember this one time I was, crying about something and my mom was really upset that I was crying and she said to me stop making that awful noise and so I began to silently cry and so pretty mm. much from that moment until I got to college if I cried I silent cried I just tried not to make any noise whatsoever so mm. that just gives you a, a small glimpse into the experiential nature of what I experience around conflict and emotions um, I think growing up in the Christian church and in my family of origin, there's a pretty big emphasis on the good emotions, being positive, being happy. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. a lot of, you have so much to be thankful for. You should be happy. Like that's some of the immigrant narrative. There's some yeah, of the Christian yeah. narrative of, well, God has made everything better. So there's nothing you need to cry about. There's nothing you should be unhappy about because God can fix everything. And that wasn't my felt reality. Um, my parents had a lot of conflict and they dealt with it by shoving it under the rug. Mm -hmm. uh, you know that I come from a family of three girls and I'm the youngest. And when I was 
17, my parents were facing empty nest syndrome, where I was their youngest child, I was finally going to head off to college, and they would suddenly have to face the conflict and the relationship that they had been stuffing under the rug for a decade. And it all just exploded mm. my senior year. Oh, wow. Yeah. I got kind so of- So then when you say exploded, was it like visible, like outward- uh, physical expressions of yelling yeah. or other aggression. Yeah. Totally. I would say that, I mean, genuinely to use the metaphor, it's like they, for a decade, they had just kept, sh- maybe even two decades, they had just kept, kept shoving all their arguments into this, like, we'll deal with it later. And suddenly they reached that point where it was later and they had to deal with it because me and my sisters, this big project they've been working on for 20 years, they actually needed, it was going to be done. And then they needed to look at their marriage and look at each other. So mm-hmm. there were a couple of things that would trigger them into fights. And then they would, yeah, have these fights. Usually one parent yelled and the other parent just kind of took it, which was painful to watch. And mm-hmm. then I ended up being triangulated between the two of them where mm-hmm. I would talk to one parent, they would complain about the other parent, and then I would switch. The other parent would then complain. And sometimes I tried to mediate and I just didn't have the skills to do it. I was 17. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I learned that big emotions were scary, were dangerous and were relationship ending because the things that my parents said to each other were so toxic that I remember going to college and thinking if two people can love each other so much and still say such hurtful things to each other, what is the point of love? Mm. So yeah. Mm. And did that imp- so that, that did that impact your relationships with people, both friendships and romantic relationships? Oh, hugely. <laughs> 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 I've now spent a decade. I have a lot of therapy working on mm. it. Um, I was going to say, use triangulated. That's a therapy term. That's not a term <laughs> people generally use. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, very much so. I think when I first got to college, I had this real mask on where I was just trying to be the good girl, the perfect girl. And I even had friends who would say to me, you know, Tiffany, you just seem so perfect. And I'm Mm. (laughs) like, well, yeah, that's the point. That's what I've been trying to do. But I didn't realize (laughs) that it was a wall to being seen and to being known and for people to feel like they actually knew me. Instead, instead of being multidimensional, I felt really one dimensional to them. So Mm. I feel like a lot of my relationships were pretty stunted because I couldn't actually let people come in that close. And at the first sign of conflict, I would run away or write off the entire friendship relationship as I just didn't get people. I just didn't let people get very close because I was worried about being either my dad or my mom. I was worried about being my mom and exploding on people with rage because I had push down my emotions so far. And I was worried about being the emotional punching bag for someone else. Mm, mm. Yeah. So then what did you see? At, like, did you experience any of that after you left? You know, you went to Stanford, you went, you know, far, far out of, out of New York. Although now that I'm saying that, was that intentional also? Like you were trying to get as far <laughs> away as possible? <laughs> no, my intention was to be on the East Coast for school. And through a whole mm. series of life events, I ended up on the West Coast. Uh-huh. It would re, it would it would come up every time I went home, and going home became this triggering thing. I would sometimes feel anxious before I went home. Uh, actually, even now, before I see my parents, I will feel anxious like two weeks before, and I have to remind mm. myself that they are not the people they were. I am not the person I was. I have better tools and I have coping mechanisms. Um, our relationship has evolved a lot over therapy. I've worked out a lot of my issues with my parents. But yeah, every time I went home, I felt like I regressed to an earlier version of myself, or I would feel trapped and stuck again. You know, you said also it impacted the way you led and the way you were giving feedback to people. Um, you know, in what way were you were you replicating that either too harsh or were you being too gentle or somewhere in the middle, I guess? No, that's a great question. I think that the way it showed up wasn't in terms of the tenor of the feedback but I would wait too long to give feedback Mm. because I wasn't sure how to bring it up or I was pushing it down. You know, where you have the little, when you have the misattunement or 
the disconnect or the misalignment instead of addressing it right there in the spot in a way that was, you know, simple, factual, it would, I'd hold on to it. And then they would do something else. And they would just kind of build up in the same way that in relationships, if you don't address something early on, it can build up. And then suddenly you're making these big, broad character generalizations of, oh, this person always does this, or they're never doing this. So I waited too long to give feedback. And I, and it was because I was conflict avoidant. Um, around the same time that I was starting to manage and lead teams, I realized that I needed better tools for managing conflict and having hard conversations. And so I was lucky because it's pretty early in my life that I started seeking this out. Um, I took the conflict mediation certification at Santa Clara, which is a 40 hour certification to really understand how do you navigate conflict? How do you deescalate it? I took leadership trainings on how to give feedback. First, I learned the feedback sandwich, right? Positive, negative, positive. Yeah. <laughs> and then, <laughs> which people start recognizing. They're like, oh no, she just said something positive. Yeah. Something negative is going to come. So I've evolved from there. And I think my current framework now is um, to talk about actions, impact, and what I'd want to see in the future. So I start to say, so I first describe the situation and say, oh, when this happened, this is how it impacted me. And what I want to see in the future is something more like this. How does that land with you? And I also mm. check in with them to ask them about their reality. I think this is one of the things I learned from my parents' conflict, that there always were two sides to a conflict. There's one person's narrative and the other person's narrative. And I brought that into my management. You, when, people, when two people were having a conflict, I knew there was always two sides to the story. Or when I was having a problem with one of my direct reports, I knew that there were two sides to the story. There was my narrative, and then there was the narrative of my direct reports. Mm -hmm. And being in therapy helped me to be curious about the other person's narrative in a way that I couldn't when I was 17 or 18. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm interested. Was there a specific situation that finally broke the camel's back that said, I need to do this? I need to, or I need to get the training or the certification. Yeah, it was my first relationship after college. Mm. I had had a fight with my the person I was dating at the time. And I just realized I sounded exactly like my parents, the, the whole interaction. And that's when I really, and this was around the same time, I think I was 24, 25. I just realized that if I didn't do something differently, I was going to relive my parents' patterns. Mm. And it was such a complex mix of emotions, shame, guilt, anger at myself, anger at the other person, anger at my parents, resentment. And yeah, so that's really what started my journey in therapy. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, it's awesome that you had the insight to even recognize that because that, that takes a lot of people a long time to even recognize like, hey, there's a problem here. I need to figure this out sooner. So that's awesome. So you're you're developing these skills, you're working on them. What about when when you came back to your family, you said, you know, therapy helped you kind of manage those relationships better. Um, you know, were there specific skills you saw were like super helpful with your family? Yeah, totally. So first, in classic overachieving fashion, I first tried to fix my family. <laughs> ah, yes, <laughs> yes. For a couple of years and it didn't work well. <laughs> <laughs> Then I evolved and had a little bit more maturity and said, actually, the best way for me is to actually to be um, to be the version of the person I want to be, which is mm. someone who um, takes a beat when I feel myself getting really heated, uh, who listens well. Um, you asked this question about what were some of the skills. Um, one of the skills that has been super helpful is is paraphrasing, which mm. Some people learn as a uh, part of clinician training. I took a class on, um, I took a class and so I learned the skill of paraphrasing, which is where you repeat back to the person what you've heard and then you check for comprehension. You say, did I get it right? Mm -hmm. Because again, as we said earlier, there's two sides to every story. And I obviously know my part side of the story. What's missing is the other person's side of the story. What's missing is, finding out what was the original need that was missed. So this is a skill I learned in conflict mediation training to identify the original root need that started the whole conflict cycle. And one of the things I 
would do when I was with family and we were having a fight is I would first slow down. That was super important. Then I would try to focus on that original conflict and literally ask questions until I figured out what was the original need that was missed. And it required Mm. putting aside my own emotions, my own need to be right, my own desire to defend myself, which therapy really helped me because I knew that I would be able to sit with my therapist, Mm -hmm. (laughs) talk about all the ways that I was right. And and I had my own space to be heard. So yeah, I would say needs identification and paraphrasing that made the person on the other side feel heard. And it helped us break through the log jam where conflict usually goes. One of the tips that was super helpful for me when I was take my conflict mediation certification was um, learning not to use universal languages, the universal language of saying Mm. always or never, because I would find myself doing that all the time where the person who I'm having the conflict with would also do that. And I would say, hold on, let's go back to the original conflict. And before we bring in stuff from the past, let's just stay here with this moment. Now, what is striking me though, is I grew up in an Asian family as well. And so how did they take the the shift and how you're because it's a major shift and how you're relating to them having the conversation asking questions like that's a big shift you know how did everybody in your family react to that <laughs> great question from my laughter you can tell that it was Nick. <laughs> my family has a, has had time to adjust i've been in therapy for 10 years i'm sure they started noticing that i was showing up differently within one or two years of therapy And of course, there was the active proselytizing I was doing around how they should all go to therapy to become better people, too. (laughs) I mean, we should all go to therapy. Therapy is great for everybody. I 100% agree. I think it's amazing. (laughs) I'll tell you this funny anecdote. I went on vacation with my parents last uh, last summer, which is a milestone mark because Mm -hmm. I think younger versions of myself wouldn't have been able to do that. We were traveling for 15 days. In the first five days, we were all quarantined in the same tiny London Mm. flat so and we made it without killing each other (laughs) but the moment for me was I had decided I was going to really show up as who I fully am which is some combination of executive Tiffany Tiffany who's been in therapy Tiffany who's a conflict mediator and Tiffany who's become really direct because in the western individualist corporate world you do need to be direct Mm -hmm. and I was talking to my dad about something and I was just and I said to him, uh, Dad, I'm, I'm just going to be blunt here for a moment. And then I launched into what I was going to say. And at the mm-hmm. end of it, I said, how did that land on you? And he said, you know, Tiffany, um, I mean, at this point in my life, I really see you as American. You're not even Asian anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I would say that for my parents, they appreciate that I've learned new skills. Sometimes the disconnect is hard for them. I act in ways that probably aren't familiar and Mm. what's lucky or what's good is that we have enough trust built over years of relationship of me showing up and putting in the effort of me listening, um, that they know that I love them. And so that makes it a little bit easier. Obviously adjusting to then again, the Western way of kind of how in a professional setting is different as well. Did you find you had to overcorrect a little bit to, I guess, fit in quote unquote? Oh yeah. One of the things that I learned probably in undergrad was how in different cultures, you have a different amount of pause after you finish the sentence. Mm. And so in East Asian cultures, you usually wait for the person to finish. There's a pause while you wait to see, and then you either keep going or you, or you stop. Whereas there are certain Western cultures where you, the, before you even finish your sentence, the next person has already jumped in. There's like a negative two second pause. And so I learned in the work context that I would, I would wait for people to finish before I would interrupt or jump in. And I, it was just, I was waiting too long because someone else would pick up the conversational ball. And the point I wanted to make, I, I didn't even get to make because we'd already moved on. So I had to learn to jump in negative two seconds as a person was starting to finish their sentence and trail off. Mm. I would make a motion gesture or start to speak so they would know that I had something to say. I was visually and auditorily signaling that I wanted the conversational ball. 
That's so interesting because I, as a person that does training and kind of in the learning development sphere, I feel like a lot of the best practices in companies are to have more silence now, to add that silence back in before you respond. Yeah, I think that's a really wise evolution and movement. It's great for the introverts and it's great for people of different cultural backgrounds. Yeah. Yes, the introverts, for sure. You know, the hard part about this always is, I think you referenced it, is building the courage to even try out the skill. You have to actually do it. How did you overcome that cut, that gap of, you know, that anxiety of, I don't want to try this out because I don't know how it's going to work out and just jump in and I'm just going to do it? When I was in undergrad, I, just for context, prior to undergrad, I was that kid who did everything right. And I mm. pretty much worked my ass off to make sure I did everything right. What I didn't realize was that I had grown up with a fixed mindset instead of a growth mindset. And mm. I first encountered the concept of growth mindset in, in undergraduate. So there was a Stanford professor, her name's Carol Dweck, and she wrote this book about growth mindset, which basically says, um, the fixed mindset says, you're born with a certain amount of intelligence, you're either smart or you're not. Whereas the mm -hmm. growth mindset says, no matter where you start, you can learn and you can grow. And failure is actually part of the learning process. That's how you grow. I came from this risk averse, failure averse immigrant mentality because it was super costly for my immigrant parents to make mistakes because they didn't mm. have a lot of margin. They didn't have network. They didn't have savings, but I do. And when I learned about growth mindset, I felt it, like it really unlocked me. So I began to reframe all of my hard conversations instead of if the conversation didn't go well, I started being like, well, that was one data point and this is what I'm going to learn from it. I think if I hadn't learned about growth mindset, it would have been a lot harder to take risks. It would have been a lot harder to practice new skills. And just to say it, it is always a risk. Every time I go into a hard conversation, no matter how much I prepped for it, no matter how many times I practiced it, no matter what I've done to prepare, there is still a little bit of anxiety. But what moves me forward is the belief that if we can have a better conversation and if we can move through the conflict, the relationship will go better, whether it's a work or a personal relationship. Mm, mm. It's certainly a, a more common accepted thing that to, to think of conflict as a good thing. I'm interested, what do you, you know, before we were talking a little bit about kind of the political landscape and, you know, pe different people's beliefs and then racial justice, we were, we hinted at that as well. I, you know. What do you think about those types of conversations also? Because those are ones that don't necessarily have like a really clear ending or beginning. They just kind of go on and on and we could still find people's innermost goals, deeps, needs, wants, mm -hmm. and it's still not necessarily going to change a whole lot because they're, they're in there. So what are your thoughts on when you approach those kind of conversations? So I've been on both sides of these conversations. I remember in undergrad, I was part of this group called the InterVarsity. And I first started having real conversations about race with my friends in InterVarsity who were not Asian. And mm -hmm. some of them hadn't grown up in America. Some of them came from really different backgrounds. And I would say in those early conversations, I realized how much I needed to just listen and listen to their reality. So now I find myself in conversation with family and friends and coworkers who may not have had the same level of conversations about race and maybe their first conversation about race. They may not have had friends who mm. were who, close friends who are from different ethnic backgrounds. And honestly, it's still the same thing. I need to listen to those family members and friends mm. because when I talk at them, it doesn't go well. I know this. I have several family members who don't see the world the same way I do. And talking at them hasn't helped at all. I've tried. I've tried to give them stats. I've tried to give them, explain my logic. But ultimately, it's yeah. not about stats or logic. It's about people and stories. And if they don't believe that I'm willing to listen to them and hear their, their reality and their lived and felt experiences, mm. they're not going to trust me and or the things that I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest things I've had to learn is to not try to figure, focus so much on reasoning or logic or try to out logic somebody else. 
Yeah. I think I heard one time when the when you try to debate someone and you try to answer them, you've already lost because you're not even like addressing what their concern or their priority is. I remember when the when during the pandemic when there were all these like protests, you know, racial justice protests. Um, so I was going to them and my mom was like super opposed. She was like, No, you can't go, it's not safe, it's not your fight, don't don't mm -hmm. do this. Um and I, I didn't even try anything else. I just went straight to uh, tell her, hey, think about Kaya, right? Like, when she goes outside, it's generally safe for her. <laughs> Nothing bad's really going to happen. Um, but, like, imagine if, like, it wasn't that way for her, right? Because, like, you know, obviously in our culture, like, grandkids are, like, a huge, huge, yeah. like, important factor, right? And, like, she could understand that. She was like, that makes sense. Yeah. Like she still wanted me to be safe. Like she still was worried about me, but she wasn't opposed to it because she understood. Oh, this is a this is a real concern here. Yeah, I think that is a great tactic too, um, to find something that they can empathize with. Yeah, yeah, and something in your own story too. Yeah, here you are. You're a master conflict mediator. You're a master. I mean, it sounds like you got the lingo enough to be a therapist here. <laughs> um, you know, looking back. What do you think is the one or two most powerful skills you've learned that have made the biggest, the most powerful impact on your ability to, to navigate difficult conversations? I'll give two. So the first sure. one is sure. a really tactical thing, which is identifying when you're using I statements versus you statements. Hmm. So you may have heard about this um, or you may have discussed them in the podcast, but um Often when you're in the middle of a conflict, you're thinking about how the other person has wronged you. And so you start saying all these, you start using all this you language, you this, you that, you that, and then it puts other person on the defensive. And but one of the most important things I learned was to start using I language and focusing on my own emotions. So there's a famous class at Stanford called Interpersonal Dynamics or Touchy Feely, and mm. they have this visual of staying on your side of the net. If you think about the other person and yourself, if you're saying you are whatever it is, you're crossing over the net to their space. Mm -hmm. And so it's been so important to stay on my own side of the net to say, I felt angry. I felt hurt. I felt unseen. I felt ashamed. Mm -hmm. And by pairing I language with emotions has been really powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The second thing is less of a is less of a tool or trick and more of a skill. So the skill I would offer is um, mindful self-compassion and meditation. So often when you're in the middle of a conflict, your heart is racing, the adrenaline is running, you're, you're under stress. Yeah. Because yep. on a, a very deep evolutionary level, your body thinks it's being attacked by this person in front of you. Mm -hmm. And so you're not, thinking rationally you're thinking using the the limbic or animal portion of your brain right so the reason why i say meditation mindfulness and self-compassion is because if you can practice those skills outside of the conflict you can bring them into the conflict so one of the things that i have practiced is um doing more meditation and silent meditation using my breath to calm myself that is one of the physiological ways we can tell our body that we're safe so if I feel myself in conflict being activated, I, you know, stand up a little straighter, push my shoulders back, take a really deep breath because that flow of oxygen is telling my body, okay, you're actually, you're not running from a jaguar on the fields of a savanna or a cheetah. You are actually mm -hmm. safe. And there's some real neurocognitive benefits that are going on there. When you're meditating, it's almost like you drop down into yourself. I can't quite explain it, but that's how I describe it. And mm -hmm. when I'm in a conflict, I intentionally use that same muscle, that same, not literal muscle, it's the same neural pathway to drop into myself and say, Tiffany, what's going on for you? You're activated mm -hmm. by this person. It's almost like you step out of reality and into your own inner reality and just do a quick check. And that helps me either slow down the conversation or figure out what I actually need. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'll say, hey, I'm really agitated right now. I need five minutes to go calm down. And so I leave the conversation and come back to it. Other times it gets me clear on what I actually need because instead of it being about 
you or the other person. It's like, oh, my original need that was missed was I wanted to be seen. And when this person said this thing, I didn't feel seen. And so I took offense at it or I felt, Mm. you know, but then I did this other thing so they would see me. So practicing meditation really helps me figure out what's going on for me in conflict. Well, I'll tell you, Tiffany, I feel humbled that you have, that you were just willing to share your story. And I'm, I'm just so proud of you. You know, we're about the same age, really. So I don't know, but I'm still proud of you that you've really been able to come on this journey and kind of overcome a lot of these things that could have been a, could have been a barrier to your growth and development. Thank you, Chris. (laughs) I'll return the favor and say, I feel honored to be asked to be on your podcast, to share with you my story. And I appreciate being heard and seen, which is what I feel right now. That's awesome. I'd love to have you back on because I feel like there's so many more areas we can talk about, you know, especially because we both grew up. Well, I didn't necessarily grow up Christian, but we were both Christian. Yeah. Um, You know, we shared that in common. I think there's plenty of difficult conversations around that um, because there's just so many things going on around that i would be happy to have that conversation anytime you want well tiffany thank you for coming on i'm looking forward to the next time we talk wonderful chris it's so good to see you yeah i look forward to our next one and that's it for this week big thank you to tiffany tang for sitting with me and chatting about her life and her tips Uh, leave a link to her linkedin profile in the show notes so you can follow her and keep up with her if you want to Join us next week when we're going to talk about how to respond to angry behaviors in hard conversations. See you next week.